and welcome to another edition of DKI APCSS's CTGO podcast. Capacity building and training are two important behind-the-scenes elements of counterterrorism efforts that we don't often hear about. They're longer-term measures that require time, resources, trust, and confidence building. Yet done right, capacity building and training lay the foundation for something far more enduring than the headline raids and arrests that grab our attention. They build force professionalism, quality investigations, and cooperative networks that are key to effective counterterrorism initiatives. Today, we're joined by Antonio Salgado Delgado, who is Project Manager of the Capacity Building and Training Directorate at Interpol, based at the Global Complex for Innovation in Singapore. Antonio has been with Interpol for over seven years, working with law enforcement and other government agencies in South and Southeast Asia, helping to build capacity in the fields of digital forensics, counterterrorism, and disaster victim identification. Originally from Mexico, Antonio is also an alum of the Comprehensive Security Responses to Terrorism course, CSRT 19-1, and delivered the commencement speech on behalf of the whole class last year. Antonio, we can't quite welcome you back physically yet, but thank you for joining us on air. Thank you, Elena. It's very nice to be here. Antonio, let's start, if we could, by you telling us a bit about your work at Interpol and what capacity building in counterterrorism means in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. First, thanks uh, for giving me the opportunity of being here and thank you to everyone that is listening. I guess I wanted to start by just maybe giving you a little bit of context of what Interpol does. Um, so as you know, Interpol is the largest police organization and and as part, and we have 194 member countries, which is huge. What we do is we provide operational, investigative, and capacity building support to our countries. Um, and we give them access to a system of, of notices and databases that are available for them to conduct their operations. Now, regarding terrorism, so the organization looks at three fields for conducting the activity. So we, we have, we are looking at, at, at cybercrime, we're looking at organized and emerging crime, and we're looking at counterterrorism as well. But, but all of these are, are, are based from the foundation of strategies that we have developed. And the, the important thing for you to know is that these strategies have been developed together with our countries. So, for example, the current counterterrorism strategy was developed in 2016 uh, uh, at our General Assembly in, in Indonesia. That's when, when it was approved. Um, and it's kind of like a framework that gives us the, the opportunity to focus and streamline in certain things uh, related to counterterrorism and, and, and trickle them down to the countries. Uh, we're looking, for example, at, at, at five action streams. We're looking at positive identification of networks and their members, uh, uh, border security and reducing cross-border security mobility, exploitation and abuse of, of cyberspace, uh, uh, trafficking uh, of illicit uh, weapons and materials, you know, everything that enables uh, uh, terrorists to conduct uh, uh, big scale attacks or smaller scale attacks. Um, and we also look at the financial, financial settings. The, the good thing is that when you think about the strategy, this is not something where, for example, where Interpol comes to the countries and says, like, this is what you should do. We actually conducted a consultation process with countries to see what are the activities that uh, they wanted to focus in. At Interpol, capacity building is one of the core functions. So if you go look anywhere in the Interpol uh, uh, website or if you look at the activities and if you see every activity that the, that the, the units, the internal units have, they all conduct capacity building. Um, however, I work specifically for the capacity building and training directorate, which is the, the directorate that is um, focusing on, on, on conducting guidelines and developing SOPs and making sure that capacity building projects uh, fulfill certain standards. And like, let me just give you a quick example. So for example, we based our projects in, in six pillars. Um, uh, we're looking at delivering training on what we call Interpol policing capabilities. So if we give databases to countries, it makes sense that we also provide them training on to how to use those databases. Uh, mm -hmm. Interpol has a very strong legal framework 
And it also makes sense that we explain what the, the legal framework is. And sometimes, for example, we conduct what we call operational field exercises, where we might bring a couple of countries together. And I'll give you an example of that in a minute. Uh, but we need to make sure that everything works and everything is, is working according to Interpol standards. We also do a, a subject matter expertise. So we find experts in order to connect people with countries. Then we also do training sessions on professional skills. And in here is where we maybe we take a, a more a profound human rights based approach to policing, or we focus on leadership, gender mainstreaming, anything that is related to bring the, the professional skills uh, of, of law enforcement agents in the region. Sometimes we, we work on the basis of, of infrastructure development. We uh, maybe we give equi equipment to police academies, or maybe we give equipment for border agencies to to get access to our databases in airports. Uh, we also help with countries uh, develop uh, standard operational procedures. We provide them curricula, and for us, one of the big pillars is sustainability, and 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 we do quite a little bit of e-learning. Uh, but not only your traditional click, click, click e-learning, but we are also now in the midst of developing more comprehensive uh, interactive programs. And we also develop a train the trainer sessions in order to trickle down that training. Um, in, in this capacity, to give you an idea, I, I manage, uh, I'm going to give you three short examples. I manage a, a one project called Scorpius and one project called City ASEAN. And, mm -hmm. and for example, in these projects, we conduct the, what we call the summer management operations, the summer border management operations, sorry, where we brought together 10 countries. We had a number of operational spots in land, border, uh, well, uh, you know, mar maritime ports. Uh, mm -hmm. We brought all the ASEAN countries together. And we provide training to officers to, to use our databases. How will they react if all of a sudden a stolen loss travel document uh, gives a hit in the database when they're checking uh, what is the communication protocols and whatnot. Uh, uh, so we did that. I did that for three, the first three summer operations. And, and, and we did that one every year. <laughs> Lately, we just developed what we call the e-evidence bootcamp. Um, that it's a, it, it is actually a very good course. It's an eight-week course focused on digital evidence. Um, in which we had the opportunity to bring together prosecutors, judges, law enforcement officers to learn about what digital evidence means in the region. So that in a nutshell is what capacity building means uh, for us and how it ties to, to counterterrorism. Wow, that's that's quite a nutshell, Antonio. A lot of breadth and depth covered in your work. So thank you for taking us through that. Um, are there any best practices and lessons learned in this area of capacity building and counterterrorism that you can share with us? I, I, have, pre I have prepared for you that what are some of the, the good practices uh, that, that we have found um, mm -hmm. through the execution of projects. Uh, the, okay. This list is not exhaustive, but, but for the interest of time, I'm just going to talk to you about four points. Please. Um, the first point that, that we put forward is that equipment is important, but processes are more important. Okay. To give you an idea, right now I'm managing a project on digital forensics. And digital forensics officers, they rely heavily on tools. But if, they don't, if countries do not have strong SOPs, uh, uh, let's say for first responders, and you don't train them on those SOPs, evidence collected in the field might be inadmissible in court. So you mm -hmm. could have the best tool, but if you don't have the process in, in line, uh, uh, then, then, then you have a little bit of the, a disconnect. Um, we also, sometimes when we're looking at equipment, we, we also try to work with, with tools that we can find on the open source or customizable tools, you know, like uh, a tools that we can give to the officers and then they can modify themselves. Um, so a lot of our training, many of our training sessions are, are uh, uh, they crafted around this concept. The thing is, we cannot always rely on the heavily purchase of tools. Uh, uh, and we realize that maybe sometimes countries can do better having a basic tool that they can then later modify, right? And um, what, what we, one of the things that we want to tackle down is an unhealthy dependence to handouts. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine, for example, you are uh, uh, the, the government of Interpolia 
and I come and give you a, a certain equipment that, that you are going to use. Maybe you're able to have that equipment as a, I mean, while the project lasts, but what is going to happen next year when the project is not there? Are you able to maintain right. it, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so for us, in that sense, the, the, the good practice and the lesson learned is that sustainability is key uh, in that sense. The, the next one that I was thinking is uh, uh, involving police academies is crucial. And, and, and I guess in, in, the, in the space of the APCSS and in the space of military law enforcement agencies, sometimes these uh, um, academies tend to be overlooked. But if you're overlooking at them and you're not exploiting them, I'm going to tell you, please don't use them. Uh, uh, to give you an idea, last year in our, uh, we organized a training session on weapons and materials in Malaysia. And thanks to, to the support of the police academy, we were able to bring members of the CBRNE unit. And they were also able to lend us equipment. This was great because all the participants were able to test the equipment, uh, put the bomb suits, and, and see what are some of the challenges that they face. But one of the unexpected consequences is that one of these academies was filled with young cadets, uh, and, and the cohort of that time were like all women, right? Uh, oh. or, or, or like maybe 60% maybe women, right? right. And, usually, and usually when, when you think about it, uh, uh, the, the fact that you have that equipment there for a week gave the opportunity that to 400 of these women to come and learn about PPE and how it is monitoring and available, or like how, how can they get involved with this. And now, now when, you, when you look at that, it's like maybe you have a, a great number of law enforcement officers, women, that are entering into the force and they are going to become at some point maybe senior officers. Uh, maybe this is something that they, they never thought it was going to be available for them. And now, uh, thanks because of that collaboration, they got some exposure to that. And, and, and for me, this is one of the great things. Now, police academies give you a lot of uh, security, infrastructure, uh, uh, know-how. They, they, all training materials that you develop, you're able to, to give them back to the academies and then they may be able to integrate them into uh, their all curricula. Um, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, we went to Bangladesh and, 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 and we went to the police staff college in the framework of a criminal in intelligence analysis training session. And what we did then is we worked together on a framework to give some, some uh, equipment to, to the police academy in Bangladesh so that they had access to what we call our Interpol policing capabilities and access to our uh, e-learning center. Um, and, and I'm happy to tell you, for example, now many, many projects in the organization uh, uh, and many, many units are using the, the police staff college as a, as a base. And I think that this is just a, a, a good practice. If involving police academies is definitely crucial and the way to go. I have two more for you for, in terms of the lessons learned. And, and one is maybe uh, one that is uh, in the mind of everyone. And, and we were thinking about never in silos. Now, every time that we interview people, uh, and this is kind of like some consensus that I bring you from the front line, is that all units recognize that uh, counterterrorism and transnational crime units uh, work very much in silos. However, and uh, it's they also realize that they can achieve much more when agencies can cooperate with one another. Mm -hmm. and we bring participants with different backgrounds to each of the training sessions, just to leverage the skill set. Uh, for example, to give you an idea, in situations in which we are responding to a, a mass casualty incident or a, a, an attack uh, conducted by a, a lone wolf or, a, or by a coordinated group, by a coordinated uh, you know, team of, of individuals, that requires intervention of many teams. So you will have in the scene, you will have someone that is like maybe your fingerprint expert, you will have your DFL expert, you will have a, a, your, your, the person conducting victim identification, CSI, you will have medical teams and whatnot. 
So that's why when we do training sessions uh, uh, in that regard, we bring people, for example, that are experts in explosives, but experts also in disaster victim identification, experts on, on CSI, experts on counterterrorism. And sometimes we also bring people, uh, uh, maybe we may bring people from heads of police or the communication of, uh, of, 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 of police agencies, uh, the spokespersons, just so that they see what is it that is happening when we are doing in a, a training session like that? The only thing I wanted to tell you is that um, if a training session happened where it was never evaluated, did it achieve its objectives? This is something mm -hmm. very important. People are often overlooking the, the meat that they can obtain when they are doing a monitoring and evaluation. So I would just uh, uh, advise everyone to strengthen their, their, their monitoring and evaluating skills. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and to pay attention to what senior officers saying are saying six months, uh, 12 months, uh, a couple of years. So, for example, in the closing conference of Scorpius, we, got like a, we brought together senior officers from the countries who were beneficiary. And even though that they did not participate in the countries, in the, in the training sessions, uh, we were able to extract some, uh, uh, some good knowledge from them. So I just wanted to keep you that into consideration, and these are kind of like my my, my the the big stories I could I could uh, the, the 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 main lessons learned I could tell you for now. Yeah, no, it's all really helpful, and I think really very practical tips that we can all uh, learn from in the region. Um, you've promised us uh, uh, at least one success story. Uh, I'm sure you have many. Uh, could you please highlight at least one, if not a few? from your experience at Interpol? Uh, absolutely, and you'll have to do some time management with me. <laughs> uh, but uh, okay. but I, I want to tell you about a training session that we organized in Nepal. And now, now let me give you a picture. When I mention sometimes uh, countries, and you'll maybe hear me say Nepal, or maybe you heard me say Bangladesh or Malaysia, we do this in the concept of projects, right? So in these projects, even though the training session in Nepal, we aim to bring uh, the South and Southeast Asian region for a uh, two weeks or, or, or different training sessions focusing on different topics. But, but, but for that, and, and knowing what I tell you about the, the police academies, sometimes we organize these training sessions locally. And, 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 and one of the training sessions that we organized that was a very success story, that was very successful, sorry, was our post-blast investigation training course. Okay. Uh, we, we held this together at the National Police Academy and the Special Task Force Academy in Kathmandu, Nepal. Now, what made this uh, uh, training story successful? Well, for once, we were able to bring a multi-stakeholder team to deliver, to deliver this training session. So as part of the team, we have a member from the Australian Federal Police. We also had a, a couple of members from the Pathology Institute of, of Western Australia that came and, and developed, a, a, that helped us through, through mortuary process and disaster victim identification. We also had a, a, the head of the digital, uh, big, the, the, the disaster victim identification unit in, uh, in Indonesia. We also had at the, at the time a, a post-blast uh, investigator expert from Canada, one from the UK. And uh, all management of explosives and other uh, uh, situations was done by the Nepal police. Okay. Uh, ah, I forgot to tell you that because we had also uh, an element of, of mortuary management, uh, in addition to the people to the Western Australia, we were also bring people from the Nepal uh, Forensic Pathology Institute. And, uh, and, and we were able to bring uh, one forensic odontologist and, and the head of the of the Forensic Pathology Institute. Um, for this training session, we were there uh, for a week. Um, we, uh, we are, the team arrived a little bit earlier and, and, and basically what we did was uh, a, a prepare the exercises and, and, and make sure that, that we understand the lay of the land, coordination, everything, so that it was ready for the, for the countries. We had, a, during the five days training session, the, the first couple of days, we focused on, on bomb scene examination, to give you an idea. And, and 
we discussed things as to how uh, collect evidence, uh, how to interpret the scene, the different S -A -A, uh, things that they need to be aware. Health and safety issues is, is key uh, because uh, you, you know, like maybe you are dealing in a situation in which uh, maybe you still have life explosives, even though that uh, the, the detonation already happened, or maybe you have contamination materials, so you need to go uh, dressed in full PPE. Uh, and these contamination materials could be coming from the explosives themselves or from, from, from the remains. Um, and, and, and we also had a focus as to what e evidence looks like. So one of the things that we did was like on the, on the weekend before, in partnership with the Nepal police, we exploded uh, a couple of boxes that we uh, uh, developed together containing some, uh, and we generated fragments. And what we did is like we put these fragments in bags and then we, we brought them and, and, and participants had to swift to, the, to, the, to a simulated rubble and, and mm -hmm. try to see like, okay, this is how like a SIM card could look like. Oh, this was a piece of a wire. And then when you see the pictures and, and hopefully uh, uh, I'll be able to, to find and, sh and share some for you so that you can put or, or a link to the press release of that session. Um, oh, wonderful. That, 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 that help participants to see what they're looking for, right? right. Uh, 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 because, because for you to be able to, to determine who was a bomber, uh, you need to, to, to have an idea of what the bomb looked like. Sure. So, so this is something that we do. Then we also focus, like for, for day two and day three, we focus on uh, the management on, on, of the scene itself, life. Uh, meaning uh, we exploded a device and then we went to the scene, we coordinated, we had different teams. Uh, we actually had two concurrent scenes happening at the same time with team leaders, with uh, participants coming, collecting the, the evidence, filling in the Interpol DVI form, which is the form that we use to, for the, the identification of, uh, of, of mass casualty victims. We also did remains management. For this, we donated a, a container to the Nepal police uh, uh, in which we, the, the container could be used to either produce uh, uh, fragments for the, for the training session or uh, it could be deployed to, uh, uh, as, a, as additional storage capacity in, in, in the case of a, of a mass casualty event. And then uh, what, one of the things that we did is that we also uh, used biological material. We simulated biological uh, uh, material. So uh, to give an idea to participants as to how the, the, the evidence decays rapidly overnight and how the importance of having a proper human remains management is, and also allowed us to bring uh, aspects of contamination uh, into, the, into the mixture. Um, the good thing about this is that uh, once the training session was over, we had already trained the Nepalese as to how to conduct this training session themselves. We had brought people from South and Southeast Asia to collaborate together because uh, interoperability is key in that regard uh, and mm -hmm. how to collaborate and how investigations are being held are key. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, we donated the actual training materials to the academy. And, uh, and, and I just wanted to, this is the only part I'm going to read, I, I promise. This was yep. a quote uh, by, by uh, the then executive director of the National Police Academy. And then they were mentioned, the training knowledge and materials provided by Interpol will allow us to increase our capacity to respond to terrorism attacks and our institutional memory. And therefore, we welcome the opportunity to have hosted this training. Um, so, so I don't know, this was one of the, 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 the best practices, that, the, 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 the success stories that I could tell you. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not sure you post... have a whole library full of success stories um, yeah, definitely. that will take several podcasts, right? <laughs> I, the, only thing I, the only thing I wanted to tell you is that sometimes, uh, uh, and, and this ties with the evaluation of things, and... Uh, and at Interpol, we're always constantly listening to, to our countries. And, and in some of these training sessions, the training sessions are born from a needs from the country or a several, several countries. 
Right. We, conduct, we conducted a DBI session in Sri Lanka uh, uh, because uh, the head of police asked us to, to, to look into that. And, 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 and this was also very successful. Countries asked us to, that they wanted to work together with prosecutors and the private sector. And we brought uh, uh, sometimes Facebook or sometimes uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation or, or judges and prosecutors and, and law enforcement together into the training session. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes the training sessions can support uh, development of, 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 of other countries' capabilities. To give you an idea, when we did the CBRE uh, uh, training session in Malaysia, the one I told you about the women, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, this was also an opportunity for, for Malaysia to nominate additional officers as mm -hmm. they are like thinking about developing a, a, a first response training program on CBRE. So, so, so they, we had people coming from that session. We had 10 Malaysians attending and, and we had people from the CBRE unit, but like Malaysian Nuclear Agency, the Training Directorate and Counterterrorism. So, so that's, that's in a nutshell. I, I think uh, success stories, uh, yes, you're right. We, we have many. <laughs> big, my colleagues, are we're working on a number of regions in, in the Americas, African region, uh, we have projects in Europe. We have projects for the Pacific. I, uh, we have co colleagues working on environmental security, in in in, in illicit trafficking, in cybercrime. Uh, so, so I, right. I, I guess I guess you could you could do a podcast with each one of them and still uh, have a lot exactly of exactly. <laughs> but that's a good problem to have too many success stories. Too many success um, stories. I, I want to round off this podcast by asking what counterterrorism trends you foresee developing in the near future and how might they impact uh, capacity building in the region? So I, I, I just wanted to, to, to start by saying that uh, myself, I've grown into this position, but I do not work with the counterterrorism unit directly, even though that I sometimes manage uh, counterterrorism projects. Okay. However, uh, 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 however, one of the things, and 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 because I'm I'm dedicated uh, uh, to learning more, and I'm constantly uh, uh, reading or developing project proposals as such, I've realized something in the last couple of years that uh, 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 has increased my concern in this regard. You start seeing definitely a change of what was your traditional target. Mm -hmm. um, and if you see, and perhaps this has been exacerbated by uh, COVID-19, but you could also already see it uh, before COVID-19 happened. I remember uh, this was something that, 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 that went into, uh, put me in full alert mode when we were having the class with Sam Mullins last year on, 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 on terrorist motivations. And mm -hmm. he mentioned the case of uh, 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 Al Baghdadi, uh, the now 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 dead. But uh, um, he mentioned that the, that they were putting forward the concept of war of attrition, meaning mm -hmm. uh, attacking most vulnerable groups whenever they are least expected. And and you can see this in the context of COVID, for example. You can see cases in which uh, homemade bombs were produced in in. Uh, or like in a general uh, in a general hospital in a nation country, right? It, it didn't cause uh, uh, injuries, but uh, they had to evacuate patients, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you also see extremist groups, and maybe uh, 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 Tom, who gave you the, the the podcast a couple of weeks ago, talked about that. Uh, but now extremist groups are also uh, uh, spreading a, a, a coronavirus, or or like rather promoting the, the spread of coronavirus. And, 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 and I don't know if you follow Interpol News, uh, the, the, our cyber directorate unit just very recently pro uh, 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 published something about how hospitals are also um, attacking with ransomware, uh, rather hackers are attacking with ransomware uh, uh, hospitals in mm -hmm. the, uh, during COVID. Yep. And, and the one thing I wanted to tell you, and, and just to tie it back from the... Uh, to the capacity building and to what we've been talking to uh, throughout is that all of these problems require uh, uh, are unprecedented for many of us. 
uh, uh, we never thought that uh, 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 people would even be capable of doing something like that. Mm-hmm. And, and, and even uh, uh, law enforcement officers and humanitarian actors and uh, uh, medical public health actors and military, they never really quite confronted uh, the, the, the challenges that we are uh, being faced for, mm-hmm. that we are currently facing. And so for this reason, last year, uh, uh, I, I led the development of a proposal that we entitled Black Swan. Okay. And, and, and Black Swan uh, basically uh, is focusing on, on, on kind of like two pillars. One of them is the mass fatality incident response. And, and how are we going to work together with law enforcement and other emergency uh, actors in order to cooperate during situations where uh, a mass, ca- mass casualty happened? Uh, but this means how are we going to coordinate with police? How are we going to coordinate with military? And now how are we going to coordinate with the public health sector? If mm. nobody... You know, like in many, many years ago, when they started attacking hotels, uh, all of a sudden law enforcement agencies started developing training for hotels as to how they can uh, spot risks, right? Right. I don't know, I don't know if there are initiatives like that happening already uh, for public hospitals, but, uh, but maybe this is just something that, that, that should consider, that people should consider. The, the other thing that we were looking at is at developing uh, professional policing leadership skills and protection of victims mm-hmm. uh, uh, and survivors, of course. And, 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 and for this, uh, you know, I'm very grateful because my hierarchy allowed me to go. I went to Harvard Kennedy School last year for one week to learn a little bit about crisis leadership. I, I had the immense opportunity to go to, to APSSS, APCSS. Uh, to do the uh, uh, the CSRT CSRT 19, and 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 I also received some training from the Geneva Center on on security policy, uh, and just to try to figure out how could we coordinate the the, the leadership bit into the, the 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 incident response and and to emergency management. I was reading the other day a uh, uh, like a quote from a from a scholar, a very famous scholar here in Singapore. And the name is Rohan Unaratna, and, and, and he's quite well known. But what, for me, what it striked is that in one of his uh, uh, sentences, he had that, that law enforcement agencies need to move from a, from a need to know to a need to cooperate, which mm. means that even if you consider it in COVID-19 or uh, past COVID-19, uh, we need to find frameworks in which we are actively talking to one another and we can break the silos and, and we are able to cooperate particularly in emergency management situations. Right. Well, cooperation is something that we constantly try to emphasize at APCSS, as you know. And we could probably go on talking for at least a few more hours, Antonio. But uh, thank you so much for sharing your insights and experience. It's been so valuable listening to how rich a field uh, capacity building in the region actually is with all its promising good practices and success stories, despite the challenges of terrorism itself. So Antonio, in the eternal words spoken here at APCSS and in Hawaii, mahalo for your kukua. Mahalo. It was very nice speaking to you. I'm Alina Noor and I've been your host for this podcast. Tune in soon for the next edition.